Me when we're live. So it's your job, man. We're live now, I thought. <laughs> You're sorry. Welcome, everyone, to episode 11 of HR Leaders Live, the show where we discuss the future of work with today's most innovative and successful people leaders. As always, my name is Chris Rainey, co founder of HRD Leaders and host of the HR Leaders podcast. As always, uh, I'm joined by the fabulous Jill Katz, CHRO at Symbol HR, and uh, the ever dashing <laughs> Matt Burns, <laughs> CHRO at YISC. Today's special guest is the, uh, the one and only Dave Orrick. Um, welcome to the show, Dave. How are you? It is such a privilege to be here, Chris. Um, it's fun to uh, be here on a good hair day for two out of the three of you. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I just, I, I, before we start, we, we should ask both Dave and Matt, um, who did your hair today? <laughs> Dave just did it just then. That's it. Done. Dave. <laughs> done. Matt never does his hair. He's got an assistant behind the camera that comes in. Actually the show. real hair. It's plastic. <laughs> it's plastic. <laughs> Dave, Dave, before we jump in, for, for the two people in HR <laughs> that don't know who you are, give us a very brief overview of who, of who you are and uh, your work. Sure. I'm a grandfather and a husband. No, I, uh, I'm a professor at the University of Michigan who doesn't teach there very often. I do executive programs. And I sit in this beautiful office and uh, watch the sun on my hand and write books and, and think and uh, do a bit of traveling. So I've written a couple of books and uh, done a little bit of thinking about HR. Fantastic. We're going to do things a little bit different today because I know, we, I know Matt and Jill have been dying to have a conversation with you for a while. So I'm going to let them kick things off. We'll start with you, Jill. Because I know you've been dying to, to ask Dave a few questions. Excellent. Well, the first thing I'm going to shamelessly say is that having a professor from the greatest university in the entire country is just an outstanding <laughs> honor for me. So, Dave, I, I love having you on the show with us, and, and I appreciate it. I know that you came on so that you could be live on screen with Matt, but I did want to call out the Michigan piece. <laughs> well, I love the sign in the back, and let me just say, Jill, when I hear those kind of comments, I should say I represent the alumni office and let me give you an address for the, uh, for the check. So, uh, happy I, to depending on how well the show goes today, my checkbook is in this drawer and I'll, and I'll get right to it. Super. No, thanks, Jill. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. So Dave, we got a lot of questions and people are so excited that you're here with us today. Um, I wanted to kick off with um, I think some of the, the hotter topics that are out there today, and we're just hearing data, 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 data. And I'm curious from your perspective, what is the actual role of data in human resources? Where does the data begin and end? And where does the human piece begin and end? I'm going to give two answers to that. First, um, well, three answers. First, data is not new in human resources. Yep. Um, yeah. You know, in your work at Macy's and Chris knows that good human resources has been an evidence base for decades. Um, we know that. But, but I think we've seen, part one, a four-step evolution in the way we use data or information. One is we do it for balanced scorecards. And we try to say, what does HR do? I did a book called Balanced Scorecards with some great colleagues 20 years ago. Today, that book should be thrown away. Um, it should be taught at Michigan State. Number two, we use the data for insights. So we call through a cloud set of data. We get insights about employees or their behavior. Number three, we use data for intervention. Should we hire A, B, C, or D? Should we train A, B, C, or D? And number four, we use data for business impact. My sense is that we've got to get data from a scorecard, which is kind of a, an activity, how many people got 40 hours of training, to, to insights to intervention, to impact. And Dick Beatty at Rutgers talks about that. And so the, the goal of data is not the HR data. It's the data that will have impact on customers and on investors. The second hand is there's two types of data in the world. And this gets directly to your question. You would know this having your experience in retail uh, as well as Matt. One is what's called structured data or statistics. It comes in a spreadsheet. I can do the analytics, I get all the data, I do my regressions, I do my statistics, and I get insights, intervention, and impact. The second kind of data is called unstructured data. It's observation, it's anthropology. It's what you observe, what you feel. In Macy's, I assume you had a lot of structured data. Here's the data, here's what sales, here's what's not. But you also had unstructured data. Sure. And, and I think in HR, we sometimes right now are too gaga over structured data. Give me the statistics. Well, sometimes it's the unstructured data that gives me the insights, the intervention, and ultimately the impact. 
Awesome. Matt, I know that you do a lot of work around data as well. Is there anything you would add there? Are you going to ask me to follow Dave Ulrich with a comment on data? <laughs> not, o- not only am I going to ask you to do that, but this is live and being filmed. <laughs> My mom's going to be so proud. Um, we've talked about data a few times. Um, I think we've talked about balancing humanity and the qualitative quantitative conversation. Um, and I think what I would say, and I had a discussion with somebody yesterday, we were just having a quick networking call. The game has changed around data. So 15 years ago, you could monetize information in a really meaningful way. You could write a white paper, submit it, and then get, you know, monetize that, that particular product. Today, information is so ubiquitous that it is very inexpensive to produce and very inexpensive to acquire. And the fact is that there's more data and information out there than most of us and most HR departments know what to do with. So it's not an issue of not being able to grab the data, it's making sense of the data you actually have. So when people ask me, how does HR need to interact with data going forward? I totally agree with what Dave is saying. And I would add one more piece, which is, I think the skill sets in the future are really threefold. The first one is synthesization, which is to take a lot of information and boil it down to really simple, complex ideas. Number two is curation, which is to put those small ideas in some sort of sequence that makes sense. Uh, And the third one is storytelling, which is to tell that in a very compelling way to drive an action, to drive a decision, to drive a result. I think nowadays, if I'm looking for skill sets from HR professionals, it's can you take disparate forms of data, large sums of information, and find a mechanism to distill it, curate it, and then share it with the audience. Yeah. Can I, can I just, and I know you have a lot of questions and this isn't a show just on data or people hang up quickly, but, um, <laughs> but I think the way to get those three, and I really like simplify, curate and, uh, and, uh, and uh, storytelling is to start with the impact. What will this data do to help me sell a product to a customer? What will this data do to build an investor confidence in my firm? And, and, and if we start from the outside in the impact of what we're going to do they don't want to hear a lot of stuff that's simple. They want it to be curated and focused and they want it to be anecdotal and real. And so I really like those three uh, pieces, Matt. And I think we get there to some extent, we get there better. I'm going to steal those, by the way, that'll be on LinkedIn next week. Um, <laughs> not, not for we all. Matt, Matt, you can, you can go home now. Yeah, I'm done. No, uh, <laughs> but I think we get there by focusing not on the data, but on the impact the data might have on a, on a stakeholder we care about. So just uh, to build on it. I, I love the build on what you said. Fantastic. I'm going to steal one of Matt's questions, actually. Um, one of the things that Matt mentioned to me today, which really just sparks a, a sort of a light bulb in my mind, which I want to ask you, it's always hard to find a question, hard to find a question to ask Dave Warwick. And, uh, you know, you've seen so many changes over your profession, um, Dave, and spoke to so many leaders. And I'm just wondering, looking back, you know, what changes in HR over the years surprised you the most? Love that question. Great question. Great question. <laughs> Chris, I should ask you. Chris, what do you think? I knew you was going to do this. I said to Matt and Jill before the show that they were going to ask me the question back. Um, I, I think what we just we just touched upon one of them, which is the the data analytics piece. I think that's shocked a lot of the HR leaders that I'm speaking with now. Because if you think about HR ten years ago, if you went mentioned the word predictive prescriptive analytics to a HR leader, he would he or she would have said, "What are you talking about?" Um, so I think that for me was been the biggest shift, to be honest. Uh, the data piece. So you kind of just mentioned it. Um, so I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna give a good shift and a negative shift. Uh, which one should I do first, good or bad? Start with a negative. <laughs> I think sometimes in HR, we don't seem to build on others and make progress. We seem to be in some um, endless do loops. I, I've been reading stuff, people saying HR should get to the table. That's the next agenda. And I'm oh, going, oh gosh. my gosh. Oh, if you, I can't hear that anymore, Dave. I'm going to put on bell bottom pants and a, and a, and a, and a <laughs> tight coming, sweater. I mean, it, yeah. it just feels like we're running up sand dunes. We do a step forward and two steps back. That, the, and, and, and the second one, and, and that's frustrating me that, that people seem to think they've discovered something new and they've just simply rediscovered something old. The good news is I think we're moving away from navel gazing and HR is not about HR, but it's about the business. And I think we're beginning to say, I don't care how many people got 40 hours of training. I mean, that's, that's an analytic that's fairly easy to measure, but it's useless. It's a scorecard. I want to know, did the training have an impact on customers, on investors, on employee morale? 
And, and I think that's a progress that I see coming. Now, again, the negative, we keep, we keep recycling old stuff rather than moving forward. The good news is when we do move forward, it's, it's, it's not about HR. It's about the impact HR might have on things and people we care about. Justin, well, I'm going to ask this question quickly because someone just dropped it to me in the, uh, in my LinkedIn messaging. <laughs> so just sent me a message for you, Dave. It's from Jose Pinto, who's the HR director and organizational innovation um, director at the Venetian in Macau. So <laughs> I'm not sure what time it is in Macau, but thank you Jose, for being, being in. And he said, uh, Dave, first of all, he said, make sure you thank Dave for all of his books. So I have to throw that one in there. You've been a true inspiration to him, Dave, along his career. Um, so he just wanted me to make sure I said that. And then the question he had is, you know, from all of the books that you've published, Dave, all of the talks and all of the work that you've had, you know, always done, sorry, what's yet to be said and done in HR? What's yet to be said? So it kind of goes along with what you just, what you just, the, the point we just kind of made. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. What's yet to be said. If I knew what was yet to be said, I'd have said it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, um, I mean, that's a good response, to be honest. That's what I, that's I, I, I can think of. I am committed, and Chris, you and I have talked about this. That, and it's an interesting test of myself. I'm older than all three of you combined on the phone, probably. But <laughs> do I have twenty to twenty-five percent new material every eighteen to twenty-four months? By the way, that sounds really easy when you're starting in the field, but no, holy smokes! I mean, so what I've got to be committed to myself as I, as, I, as I continue to do it is I've got to have learning agility. I've got to have growth mindset. I've got to be curious. I've got to undo what I've done. And that's, that's back to why I get frustrated about people rediscovering old stuff. So I, what's new? I think, well, I'll, I can tell you some stuff that's bubbling for me. In the talent space, I think we're moving more quickly into – we know how to get good people in. We know where to find them and all the war for talent. How do you get people not just committed behaviorally, but emotionally? How do you get people to have a sense of belief, a sense of belonging, and, and this emotional commitment, which I think is coming? In organization, how do, you, how do you get organizations that have the capabilities to respond in a changing world and to scale that quickly? In leadership, how do you how do you deeply embed leadership so it's not in one person? So those are some of the ideas I'm using on. Um, I love questions. And Jose, I make you a bet. Uh, that's a Venetian term. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> uh, I'll go red 13. But I'll make you a bet that there are problems at the Venetian in Macau that you don't have great solutions to around talent, leadership, organization. Boy, would I love you to share those with me on LinkedIn and say, Dave, I've got a little scratch in my head or I'm struggling with something. I just don't get this. And, and that's where I hope we in HR can, can be uh, mm -hmm. maybe thought leaders at probing what those new problems are. And yeah. uh, Jose, yeah. if you've got those at the Venetian, send them along. It is, is it careers? Is it retention? Is it agile employees? Is it organizational culture? Is it leadership? What is it you're wrestling with that would help the Venetian have even more revenue than it does today? Well, yeah, Jose, I hope that answers your question. And, you know, Jose has actually sent me seven questions. <laughs> so, Jose, drop those on LinkedIn to us and uh, not only get the great feedback for Dave, but also, the, you know, all of the people that, we, that follow us and, and, and Dave on LinkedIn as well. That's what it's for, you know? You know, I would, I would jump in. There was a question that you asked before, Chris, that I, that I thought was interesting. And I really, Dave, appreciated your comments. It was about what is shifting in HR o over time. And... What, what I have found, and I'm curious, Matt, if you've had the same experience, and, and Dave, just as a, a bit of history, I've been in, in head of HR roles over the past 15 years at, at four large companies, um, all in fashion and retail. And what I have found is that conversations about leadership and the importance of leadership have always been there. But when it came time for the rubber to meet the road, for performance reviews to be created, for compensation decisions to be made, it was a struggle always for the leadership component to play the role that I believe it should play. And so I recall fighting a war, waging a war at a company that I worked with to get a leadership component on the review that was worth 20% of the review. And I remember thinking, oh, this is such a huge win. It was, it was so incredible. And this was probably seven years ago. And throughout the, the past several years, this kind of conversation I think has persisted in companies to make leadership 
actually a qualifying requirement of a job. Um, and so for me, that's been one of the shifts where the leadership conversation goes from being just a conversation to an actual expectation of the role that is actionable. And I don't know, Dave, if you've seen a lot of that in your research or Matt, if you've seen similar things happen within the let industry. Me, let me first of all comment. One of the things we're finding about leadership today is agility and the ability to deal with change. We just saw it. Matt uh, sent us online a note to the panel that he had a crisis in one of his facilities and he's had to pull off. So I think you've just seen the model, Jill, of what leadership looks like. It's, it's, it's having the capacity to respond real time to the issues that are there. So Matt, we appreciate your uh, spirit with us and uh, hope there's no crisis that's, that's, uh, Matt, that, we're that, thinking of you. that threatens well-being. So our thoughts go to you. Um, I really agree. I think and that's, I, I, I don't think it was in our, it may have been in our discussion before while we've been on. There's the, the theme that I picked up for my work is ideas with impact. And I've said big ideas, the impact will happen. I'm now starting to go the other way. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing people want quick ideas, TED Talks, short blogs, quick headlines, disruptive HR, but they're not getting impact out of those that I think we've got to really start to focus on impact. And that's leadership. Yeah. Um, we did a book called Leadership Sustainability. Here's what we found. Ask almost any leader, what do you need to do to be better? It could come from your 360, your performance appraisal, your coaching, your training. And within a matter of minutes, he or she will say, oh, this is some things I could do to improve. For me, when I teach, and I love to teach, you need to be more organized. Chris has seen me teach. He, I don't <laughs> know if it was Chris or someone else. He said, it's like Robin Williams in Good Morning Vietnam. You just boom, all over. <laughs> so I need to be more structured. I need to be more organized. And then the question we ask a leader is, so how long have you needed to be that? A week, a month, a year, five years, 10 years? Well, probably 10 years. Well, cripes, you've had 360s, you've had coaching, you've been to training, you've had mentors. You've got the idea, but it's not getting sustained. Anyway, I, I really agree, Jill, that that's something I've been musing on is how do you get good? I By the way, sustaining bad ideas is is futile. That's not going to help anybody. Yeah. But sustaining ideas and implementing them and having an impact, I think, really is a challenge of our field. Mm -hmm. So then let me ask you a follow up question. Do you think that leadership skills are people are born with natural leadership skills or do you think they can be taught? Well, in, in fact, I'd say, what do you think? But this is not one we think about. There's data. The psychologists have studied this for generations. It's born versus bred, nature versus nurture. Here's the research. 50-50. 50-50. Why, why do I find that helpful? I have a predisposition. That's the nature. Um, the one I'd love to talk about is Myers-Briggs. Um, and almost everybody's done Myers-Briggs, yeah. whether you love the validity of the test. I am a hundred percent introvert, a hundred percent. And so I sit in this office and you can see the office behind me and I love it. This is where I live. It's what I love. But when I teach, I can be an extrovert. You're definitely an extrovert when you teach, Dave. I've been there. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I actually, I spit on people. I yell at people. I, I do all kinds of stuff. But you know what? I haven't had dinner with a client in years. Oh, welcome back, Matt. We hope you're okay. Um, our thoughts are with you. We, we appreciate that in such a real way. But, but I think, Jill, well, Jill, what are some of your predispositions? What just, this is who I am. It's what comes naturally. It's my strengths, whatever you want to call that. What are some of yours? It could be Myers-Briggs or one of the other tests. Um, I am, I am a big fan of, of the Gallup strength finder. I, I, I really enjoy that a lot. So for me, it is woo communication, strategic ideation, futuristic. And so what are some of the things that are, that you're not as strong on of there? I think there's 36 strengths. There's 34. Um, 34. I stand my, corrected. My lower strengths are restorative. So I have no rear view mirror. If it, if it happened in the past, to me, it's over, move on. Um, context and discipline, those are low for me. So in your, in your experience as a CHRO in major companies, can you learn those? Yeah, yes, you can. I, I mean, you can get better. You can. I would say that, 
Yeah, I think that that the skills can be practiced. Um, and so probably with a lot more energy and focus, I can work on it. But do I think that I can get great at it without having people around me that are fantastic at it? I don't know. I think you can get better. I mean, there's a there's a, a great book out of Center for Creative Leadership, The Perils of Accentuating the Positive, that if you only build on your strengths, it may limit your career. That you also need to say, in order for me to be the CEO, CHRO and now to become a great consultant, let me do a plug for Jill. Uh, please call her. Uh, and uh, Chris gets uh, 5%. Um, but, oh, um, oh, that just went from the best moment to not the best moment. <laughs> but, but I think we, we can learn to not let those things that are difficult get in our way of success. Now, I, I may never have a towering strength to being an extrovert because, and Chris knows when I teach, I sweat, I'm nervous, and, and, it, and it's stupid. I'm old and I've done this before, but it's work. And yeah. uh, so anyway, long answer to your question, about 50-50. Yeah. Matt, what do you think? I want to touch on Chris's great question that he came up with by himself previously, and also this question, kind of combine <laughs> them into, into one. I think what surprised me most, um, you know, I joined, when I joined at Human Resources uh, 15 years ago, we were talking a lot about the things Dave is mentioning, seat at the table, using data, and we're having the same conversations now. And there was a real push at that time to take HR in a more quantitative way. So there was an, there was an at least in the circles I was operating in, it was a, uh, we're too qualitative. If you want to go and work with the business, we have to be more quantitative. And I en envisioned a continued migration of that throughout the course of my career, um, and really never saw an end to that. What has surprised me the most lately, and I think it ties into leadership as well, is there seems to be a more recent migration back to humanity. So there's an acceptance that we've introduced some of these quantitative measures, whether it be technology through applicant tracking systems, whether it be policies, um, whether it be flexible work schedules. We've created all these barriers around um, success and progress. And we're moving now to a model where flexibility and agility and nimbleness are key. Uh, additionally, that idea that you have to blend the two of qualitative and quantitative together is becoming more and more important. And that really excites me as an HR practitioner that as we look forward and move more towards an area of humanity versus the more harder skills in the business, I think that is with trend. And I think that our profession is with trend. But to Dave's earlier point, without the requisite skills and approach, we're not going to be able to capitalize on that. And the last thing I want to do 20 years from now is talking about how 20 years ago we had a conversation about seat at the table. And we're doing it all over again. Yeah. So I think we need to see progress, but I'm, in, I'm optimistic that we're moving in, a, in the right direction. Yeah. Well, talk, talking about business impact, uh, Mike, who's just tuned in, dropped me a message and said, what old practices and activities need to be eliminated to make room for more efforts focused on business impact? So what areas of HR do we, old practices that our company still doing that we need to eliminate that, you know, to make room for, 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 for business impact? I would love to ask Mike what he thinks. He's probably asked that question with an intent. Um, and I'm not sure if he's able to type a quick answer, but he may, uh, <laughs> Mike, if you're still listening, put your response. <laughs> in I the... mean, he may have a pet peeve that he wants to get rid of. And while he does that, let me tell you, I, I, I've been guilty of this. I've said a lot from two, we should go from a to B from a to B lately. I've tried to moderate my thinking to say, we should pivot. We should do a and build on a to pivot to B. And, and Matt, I love your comments. We should do quantitative work, but we should pivot to also do qualitative work. And, and, and so, for example, in performance appraisal, I think we're pivoting to the three criteria Matt laid out about simple, curated, and storytelling. But I don't think that means we do away with what we had. I think that means we build on it and we pivot and move forward. So anyway, we'll see what, what he may have said on the... Uh, on <laughs> we'll see if, we'll see, I'll let you know when, when, uh, when and if um, Mike... Mike replies back. I know Matt's had to run, guys. So he's got, as, as I said earlier, he's got a bit of an emergency he needs to deal with. But that's the life of a leader in, in, in business. These things happen um, as well. What other questions? Let, me, let me tell you one of the quick, broad answers to 
the question and issue that Matt raised and that I hear a lot about. Digital is the other buzz. Every digital, everything, digital, everything. And yeah. everybody has, I don't know if you get the emails, Chris, you probably get them from me. I probably send them and Jill gets them. The latest, greatest app that will change your life. There's a, there's a million every day that come into They're my just world. flowing through. And you only have to look at LinkedIn to see every... Every, I would say, I'm not exaggerating, before I let you go on, Dave, I get about five a day from companies asking me to promote their apps. Oh, I get invited to be on. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, the one that, and I don't mean to make fun of stuff, but somebody said, we have an app that will measure your face, the, the, the distance in your forehead, your eyes, your nose, your mouth, and it will tell you if you're a good leader. <laughs> would you would you invest what? in our product? And I said, have you seen my face? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, that seems now, ridiculous. <laughs> when, when I get those, here's the questions I now ask. Number one, have they connected their app to customers and investors outside the company? Mm -hmm. So how will that app not just be an applicant tracking, but have you connected it to the customer value? Have you connected it to an investor too? Is it designed to help me move the strategy forward? Three, what are you building on? This one is for me so frustrating because uh, I think that one of my friends who teaches technology said he gets these young students who are very bright and computer literate. And they say, I have an app that's going to change the world. Put it on your phone. It's going to change the world. What should I do? And he says, take a class in how to code. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> There is something to be said about the basics, and, and that's where I'm frustrated that we're reinventing the wheel, getting to the table because you haven't studied the basics. Number four, number four um, are you able to work and adapt it to my company? So is there flexibility in the app? Because every company is ever. And number five, are, are you a good soul to work with? <laughs> I know that's a hard one, but I don't want somebody who has an app that says, here's the app, go adopt it. I want somebody who says, here's an idea, let's co-create it and adapt it together. Yeah. Those are my five criteria. That, mm. By the way, I have yet to find many apps who pass the first one. And <laughs> somebody said, well, I do all of those. And I said, show me your, 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 your brochure. Does it mention a customer? Does it mention an investor? Does it mention a community? outside the firm that your app will create value for. Oh, well, that's what we mean. No, you've not done that research. You've not done it. Is it connected to the strategy of the business? Is it, who are you building on? Who's done the work in this field that you're complimenting? Well, we're brand new. No one's ever done this before. <laughs> go away. I mean, go back to be a Spartan. Um, that was for Jill. Uh, I didn't get it, and thank you for that. <laughs> I didn't yeah. get it. I didn't get it, but it's fine. It's, uh, that's a okay. Lot, it's uh, a lot of really good Michigan stuff happening. Well, um, before before I cut, don't cut you off, Jill, Mike replied to Dave. <laughs> so oh, good. What did he say? So he said, first and foremost, it's not a pet peeve. <laughs> um, he goes, if HR is to have more impact and become agile, all of the systems and processes, um, a lot of them at the moment that are in place are, are overly cumbersome. Um, and he says it's very hard to you know carry everything forward in the business when you have very cumbersome systems in, in place in your organization. So he said, for example... You know, what impact does an employee survey, survey contribute to the business? Great. That's an example of what he, of what he had in mind. So, of that yeah, I, and, 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 and Matt gave us, and I'm really sorry, uh, Joe, but I'm old. And if I don't share what I'm thinking, I'll lose it. Um, <laughs> he gave us three criteria, simplify, curate, and storytell. I think the criteria you've had is aligned with the strategy, integrated with each other, innovative, which means fresh. And the one that he mentioned that I'd circle is simple. And it's the one that, that Mike just mentioned. I think uh, I see CD&R stuff in boards on compensation that's 30 pages long and you need a thesaurus to interpret it. Yeah. How do you put it on one page? Hmm. Um, and that is, and it's complicated because sometimes in HR, we do, um, I'm just going to do a hypothetical here. We do a five minute video with slides every 20 seconds and we think people have it. That's a hypothetical. <laughs> what they're doing is simplifying without being rigorous. So I like a diamond. Here's the question. How do we impact customers, investors? Be complicated. Be really difficult. It's complicated. And then be simple. Being simple without being complicated leads to, leads to naiveness. It leads to quick fixes that don't endure. So anyway, that's start with the question. Be broad. Be rigorous. Be based on what's been done. And then get simple and focused. And I really like, I would agree, Matt, or not. Uh, I would agree, Mike, with what you said about about getting simplicity in every process so that they're used. And right. I would 
I have a I have a question for Dave that that came in to me, but I would also add to Mike. You know, I think that for me, you know, I've had the opportunity to work on processes like like that one in many companies, and a lot about it is what is the strategy. So I'm, I I like very much what Dave said in terms of simplicity, and I think that sometimes leads you to ask the question of why are we doing this? And so I think that smarter companies and smarter HR departments should be and can be asking themselves on an annual basis, this is a process that we did last year. Is it necessary, right? What, to Dave's point, what will be the impact this year? Is there a true impact on our business, on our bottom line, on our, whatever the metric is? And then if the answer is yes, re-asking the question of how did we do it last year and is there some way to streamline it or get a better result in a faster way? And so I think if that process does not become iterative, we do as HR people sometimes get mired in the muck of doing the same thing that is cumbersome. So it was a great question. Yeah. Um, I also... Sorry, well, go ahead. I asked that I asked that question a lot on the podcast about why do you do it that way, and ninety nine point nine percent is because we've always done it that way. That those are I had in my, <laughs> which is in my office. The, yeah, which is not the reason you should keep doing it that way. I, I had a big sign up in my office that that said um, because we've always done it th- that way, and there was a big X through it. It was not allowed. It, no. my it's not but, not acceptable. Yeah, um, Dave. Jill, a question yeah, Jill. That, that came to me um, from from someone named Vicky. She asked, what is the ultimate, ultimate role and accountability of HR? Is it to the company or to the employees? I think uh, yes, yes, and you've missed three. The company, <laughs> and the, empl- <laughs> the company and the employees are inside the firm. And yes, we serve those inside the firm. I think we also serve the customers today and tomorrow's customers, whoever they are, wherever they may be, you know more than anyone in Macy's, the retail big box is not going to be the only way customers buy. We also serve investors, debt or equity or headquarters. And I think we have a broader social responsibility to serve a community. One of the things we found is that the, the HR people who have the most business impact navigate paradox. Paradox means you have to in a world in a li- you have to live in a world with duality and multiple agendas. And so we talk about five, and there's probably six or seven. But employee c- company, absolutely, customer, investor, and broader community, and and that makes it tough. I mean, if it was easy to do, they'd have simpl- simpletons going into HR. I mean, this is a we're raising the bar on HR. It is hard to do that. Is that the biggest challenge when you're speaking to all of the HR leaders, Dave? What's the biggest challenge that they bring up? Is that one of them, what you just mentioned? Um, I often start with the question, so who's your customer? Mm. And even today, years later, the answer is still 50 to 60% my employee. And I say, no, you're wrong. Your Mm. customer is the customer of the firm. Um, At Macy's, your customer is the man or the woman who's going to come into the store and buy the clothing. Am I doing HR stuff that will help make that happen? Mm-hmm. And then am I getting employees to enable that process? So um, I am an optimist. I, it sounds like Matt is an incredible optimist. Chris, I know you are. And Jill, I haven't met, but I get a sense of your optimism and your good judgment with the Michigan sign in the back of your room. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to do something fun. Hang on. I'm going to give you a quick tour of my office. I've never done Yay! this. Oh, this is so uh, exciting. So let's do this over uh, here. Oh, this uh, is back because uh, it's Nick- messy. Um, an exclusive, an exclusive. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> this is the stuff that drives me. Um, Martin Luther King, an incredible optimist. Uh, Sheikh Zayed, an incredible optimist. Uh, a family wedding picture uh, that shapes who we are. A picture our kids made of my dad and the things he did to give us joy in our lives. So why do I show that? I show that because. Um, because I could, and I haven't had a chance to do that. That's how an introvert <laughs> lives. And now I'm trying to get back to my place, and I can't get my table to move. Um, so uh, when you ask me what drives me in HR, those are the things that drive me. It's uh, I grew up adoring Martin Luther King, who taught us about the <laughs> – hang on a second. I can't get my chair to move. There we go. Um, <laughs> that's actually funny. Um, I hope we edit that out. <laughs> um, it's live. It's live. We we're live, it. Dave. It's all. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, well, there's a blooper. But um, 
I think about Martin Luther King, who, whose classic speech, I Have a Dream, inspired me as a younger man and many others to, to not live with intolerance, to not live with hate, to not live with enmity, both in organizations and in our social lives. I think of Sheikh Zayed, who was given an incredible, most people don't know him in the West, in the, but in the, in the Mideast and the Gulf states, he was given an abundance of resources through oil and in the United Arab Emirates decided to distribute those resources, not to, you still see people who get resources and want more. I have a billion dollars. I want two. He distributed resources. His job was to make others better. And then family, boy, uh, Chris, is family starting to have more impact in your life? Yeah, definitely. It's something I think about all the time now. Um, it's a constant, uh, constant. Um, before it was, and these things change throughout your life, right? Yeah. Your, your, your goals change. Um, and now, you know, there's nothing. Been more oh, what powerful. is it? What is it, Jill? I can't see it. I'm oh. just supporting what Chris is saying, because for, for those who know me well, and those who are following me, and especially Chris and Matt, there is literally, there is nothing more important than my two children, my, my son and my daughter, who really and truly make me smarter every day, make me more of a human being, make me think about diversity, inclusion, leadership, honesty, authenticity, all the things that I want to focus on in, in the work that I do. At the end of the day, the truth is my teachers are my amazing children who have not yet started to see the world through any kind of tainted eyes and who ask questions that come from a true place of curiosity and interest. And we talk so much today in, in our industry about growth mindset. And, and if you want to learn about a growth mindset, sit down with a child. <laughs> yes, yeah, true. So, love, so Jill, well, what would your, and, and I know Chris, we're going long, but Jill, what would you hope HR professionals create in organizations where your son and daughter might work in the future? I mean, it's a, it's a convoluted question, but I believe in HR. I believe Hello. It looks Dave. like it looks like Dave may have frozen for a moment. <laughs> We've frozen him in time. To We've frozen it. in time, and he was in the middle of a very, very <laughs> charged question. Well, so, ho hopefully, you guys, uh, Dave will reappear. The magic te technology. We probably. I hope put, so. But you oh, know what? Oh, there I'm we back. go. Back. Back. There we go. Very well. So, <laughs> I was asking. If your internet connection is unstable. So, so am I, but let's move on. Uh, <laughs> Jill, what would you, I believe in HR, that HR creates organizations that outlive the leaders and the people in them. What would you hope the HR people today create so that your son and daughter will have a, a workplace that gives them something? And I, I think that's one of the legacies of HR. And why, we're building systems. I don't know where your son and daughter are going to work, but somewhere out there is an HR person who's creating, to, or Chris, you're, uh, you know, what is Robin in, in, in 18 or 19 years? Where is she going to be? And how do we in HR create the setting for that workplace? Mm -hmm. To me, that's just a fascinating challenge. I mean, that is, that is a Dave Ulrich question. And my God, I wish that I had <laughs> prepared it. Because when I think about it, I look in my, I look in my notebook here, Dave, and, and there's just pages and pages that would probably come together to answer that. Um, but I, I think that what comes to me in the moment is our job as HR people and, and the, the people who are building organizations today that my daughter and son will go work in. I hope they're focusing on the culture, on the, on what it, feels like and looks like to work in those organizations because businesses are changing. Business models, business structures, products, they change, forget yearly, they change quarterly sometimes. And, and successful businesses have the ability to move and shift and be agile to make their product for their customer better. Nice. But what we look for at least what I look for when, and I've hired, I've had the, the amazing honor of hiring and developing so many HR people is a mindset is, are you bringing people into the organization? Are you onboarding people, developing people, retaining people, selecting people, identifying people, creating succession plans for people that really do think strategically about issues around belonging, and performance and diversity and structure. Are you looking for people that my three C's, Matt has a lot of his brilliant 
you know, few lines. And for yeah. me, it's, it's my three C's, which is candor, courage, and care. And, and I hope that my kids have the opportunity to work in organizations where they are challenged, where they are respected, where they respect others, where they are cared about, and they are forced and, and expected to care about others. And where leaders truly believe that their job is to invest in others to create succession. Because at the end of the day, the only thing you have left when you've left a company is your legacy. Nice. That's it. Mm. What a great Jill, place to go. I think, Jill, you took half of the uh, things away that I was going to say, but in a, in a good way, it completely relates to that. For me, I think it's just about creating a great environment for people to bring their whole selves to work. Because when people are able to feel comfortable being their whole self uh, in, a, in a workplace, everything improves. You know, their performance improves, the value that the business gains from that individual improves, productivity improves. You know, some of the organizations I worked with were so grounded in old, old, outdated tradition that I kind of felt I had to walk in that office and be and be a certain way to fit with the culture. And I believe if in the future it should be the other way around. We need to give people that flexibility that we, there's no one size fits all approach. It's different for every single person that comes into the office. Yeah. And if you can encourage that, create an environment that, 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 that allows for that. I think that's the biggest value. I would want my child to walk into an office every day where they're fully accepted for who they are and what they do, and then they can bring their whole self to work. Um, and I think the business value of being able to do that is huge. And I think and HR is perfectly positioned to, to make that change. Um, so that's, that's what I would say. And it goes along, I, got, I actually just got a message from Sophia, Sophia on, on YouTube, and she said, it um, goes along with what we're saying. She said, we're seeing this new trend now of chief happiness officers. Yes. I don't know if you've seen this. I've been seeing it quite a lot on, uh, and uh, it's mixed reviews, <laughs> but I'm seeing a lot of uh, hate, uh, companies now hiring chief happiness officers um, and really positioning those people as, a, as someone to build that culture and, and engagement and, and to help retain employees and again, allow them to bring their whole stuff to work. So that's a new thing that I'm seeing more and more now. Um, yeah, I, I, I follow, one of the people I follow that inspires me is Claude Silver of VaynerMedia. Yeah, Media. VaynerMedia, he's been on the show. Love Claude. And Claude's fabulous. And, and um, Claude's title is chief heart officer. I know it's fantastic. <laughs> I just, I'm, I love that. I think that's great. On the point of legacy, Dave, and this is one of the questions I had for you. I know it's a big question, but for you, you've been, you know, what, what do you want to be remembered for of your legacy and what your contribution to HR? Um, I hope we've made progress in talent leadership and organizations so there's the content areas but the and I hope I'm known for having continually learned and, and reinvented and all that uh, growth mindset and, and curious and all that stuff but there's three things that I'm finding people want in organizations and organizations should give people that will help customers and investors with the firm belief meaning purpose yeah um, and 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 belief has firms of endearment and belief has lots of different meanings this is not a theology belief but it's a set of the organization allows me to fulfill my purpose number two is become i have a set of gifts i have a set of strengths weaknesses i can become better organizations take individual strengths and make collective team success and number three and you use the word, Jill, and I'm going to take it out, put it in bold italics and underline it, belong. Believe, become, and belong. I think that belonging is getting lost in the digital age. I go to an airport and I see 80% of the people with headsets on, not even aware of who's around them. I go to college campuses and I see 90% of the, of the next generation um, not interacting. And, and belonging is not through social media. No offense to LinkedIn. <laughs> uh, it's not how many likes I got. It's not how many. Yeah, I had 80,000 views of my article last night. There is something tangible about that intangible of belonging. And it's, it's a connection. It's a relationship. And that's why I think, Jill, when you hold up your family and I, or I show a picture of a, of a wedding or, or a picture of my father who's passed away, I belong to his legacy. I belong to my family. And I hope we can create organizations that have belief meaning purpose that allow me to become better that allow me to to develop my gifts and talents and that give me a sense of belonging um and i hope i have created some curiosity around those outcomes so fantastic 
Well, I think that's a good place to end the show, guys. I know we we always say half an hour, but it's been 45 minutes. <laughs> and so it's very hard and difficult to to cram everything in. But Dave, we really appreciate you taking the time out to to join us. Uh, I almost feel like uh, we're becoming best friends now. I get to see you every month. <laughs> well, I just, by the way, for those who don't know, in September, do not call Chris. <laughs> Yes, true. Oh, yeah, Why, Chris? Why, Chris? What's important in your life? Baby's on the way. The first one. So, yeah. Our congratulations. Th- thank you very much, Dave. Dave. It won't change anything in your life. Oh, no. <laughs> lies. <laughs> lies. <laughs> I'll be calling you all for advice. So just prepare. No, you won't. You'll be sleeping. <laughs> yeah. When, when I no, can. No, you won't. <laughs> no, you won't. Well said. No problem. Well, look, that's all. That's all for today, guys. Again, Dave, thank you very much for taking the time thank to you. join us. Um, Dave, but, thank you so much. Thanks, it was Joe. A, really an honor and a great. Time. I hope people do follow me on LinkedIn. That's where I'm posting stuff. So. That's exactly what I was about to say, guys. Every Tuesday, right, Dave? Yeah, every, every Tuesday, Tuesday. Dave will be posting more content there. So most of you follow me there. So definitely, follow. if you're not following Dave, please make sure you follow Dave. Um, and also let us know any questions you have. Le- uh, send it over to us uh, over on LinkedIn and we'll, we'll try our best to answer them for you. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Apart from that, if you're not already subscribed, please subscribe below and hit the uh, bell icon so you're notified next time we go live. Same, same time, same place next Wednesday. And uh, I wish you all the best until then. See you later, guys. Bye, everyone.